Hello and welcome to the Kielder Observatory podcast. As we approach the midpoint of 2022, there's still plenty to see in the night sky, despite the days getting longer and the nights getting shorter. In this episode, we'll look at noctilucent clouds. What are they and how can you see them? And why is the northeast one of the best places to take a look at these phenomena? We're also joined by a special guest, Helen McGee. Now, Helen McGee is a photographic artist and a lecturer in photography at Sunderland University but also our photographic artist researcher in residence and she's got an artistic installation called Another Dimension which you can see online and actually now in person as you make your way up to Kielder Observatory. So more about that to come, more about what the night sky has in store for this time of year and much more besides on this month's episode of the Kielder Observatory podcast. Well, starting off then, uh, without further ado, um, I'm joined by Director of Astronomy at Kielder Observatory Dan Pye. Um, Dan, what's been going on then over the past few weeks at Kielder Observatory that you can let us in on? Lots of things. The big exciting news is that on week commencing the 6th of June, we're getting a new toilet. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> this, was, this, this, this is a curveball. I was not expecting this news, but uh, wow, that is big news. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah, because we, we, we lost our last toilet during Storm Arwen. And this Did toilet... You? Oh, um, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, the toilet collapsed. The, um, the 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 toilet that had been there since 2008, it, it all collapsed in on itself. So that's gone now. Um, so we're getting a new disabled to- uh, access toilet, which is coming from uh, France. It's getting made in France and being delivered to us and built. We commence in 6th of June. There you go. Put it in in diaries, slightly folks. more interesting news. <laughs> <laughs> We've installed a fireball camera on site now as well, which is very exciting. Um, the fireball camera is part of the um, the UK MON network, um, which is a, a network of uh, fireball cameras across the UK, uh, observing the skies from all different directions to look for fireballs. And it was actually um, them who saw, uh, who were able to calculate whereabouts the Winchcombe meteorite landed uh, last year. Um, so it's great to have a fireball camera on site and more and more are popping up across the UK. They're really clever because they can tell us a lot about the particular fireball that they capture as well. They can tell us about its size, speed, potential trajectory, all that kind of stuff. So that's a cool new thing that we've got installed. We're working very closely on uh, with, with uh, Durham University and a couple of other partners on how we um, bring to life our radio antenna. So that's starting to make a little bit more of an appearance. And we're also working on another project which will help us simulate galaxy formation. Um, So when we come to the observatory, you'll be able to interact with a a little machine which will help us um, simulate a a galaxy's formation. You'll be able to change all the different variables, the amount of dark matter, dark energy, and various different bits and components that make up a galaxy. And that'll help us... um, create another practical experiment that we can do particularly during cosmology events um and um aside from all of that um business as usual uh, still selling out this time of year of course we are getting a little bit lighter on the night time so it's uh, becoming more challenging to see the deeper darker structures um, but we can still do some great observations of bright objects at this time of year and noctilucent cloud season is upon us in the next week or so i think we should start to see a glimmer of hope with the noctilucent clouds and of course the return of the midge uh, which will be happening very soon as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Un- underwhelming titles for films. The Return of the Midge, I think, will probably be one of them. Um, talk-, talk to us about noctilucent clouds. We have mentioned them in the past before, but they're a, a phenomena that-, that I know that you personally really enjoy, but they're-, they're something that, particularly in the north of England and Scotland, uh, I suppose as well, in the, in the, north-, the north half of the British Isles, as you look towards the North Pole, this is something that you can see on a clear night. Uh, dis- and, it, uh, and really, the way to notice you, you've seen them, it, it, despite it being a dark night, obviously, you still get this light in the sky, uh, and that's what noctilucent clouds are. Just explain what causes them and, and what we're looking at. 
Yeah, so when we see an oxalucin cloud, what we're looking at is sunlight being reflected off of ice crystals in the upper atmosphere, in a region called the mesosphere. So that's quite high up, about 60 kilometres up in our atmosphere. And during our summertime, during our northern hemisphere summertime, that region is very super cooled around the Arctic Circle. Um, and therefore, any kind of little dust particles which come into contact with water vapours, um, they, they create little crystal, ice crystal structures around whatever they nucleate around so in in terms of that i mean it's a little bit of dust floating around in the atmosphere that suddenly has a little bit of water vapor that develops around it that water vapor freezes and then because it's frozen now it's very reflective very good at being able to um uh, refract light back down towards us um from the other side of the planet so as the sun isn't isn't completely below the horizon on the night time uh, during the summer time the sunlight bounces and scatters through all of these little ice crystal clouds um, and illuminates them and they become beautiful they start quite white and then they become beautiful blues when we start to get towards solar midnight which is usually beyond two uh, sorry 1 a.m uh, during the summer time um, and they're, they're spectacular. I absolutely love them because they are very aesthetically pretty to look at. They're, they look stunning and really easy to photograph as well. Um, and shiny, night shiny clouds as a result of not just volcanic dust and pollutants and stuff like that, but an abundance of meteor dust in the atmosphere as well. So our planet experiences 4 million meteors per day. And some of that dust... Um, is is what we're seeing uh, as a result of uh, noctilucent clouds shining on the night time. So keep an eye out, look north, and um, certainly if it's you know midnight or later when it's all dark and if you can still see the clouds, and it looks like the clouds are lit up by by the moon almost, but there's no moon in the sky, then chances are that's, that's what you're looking at, noctilucent clouds. Have a look, tick them off your list, and, and share your pictures with us as well if you, uh, if you manage to snap any, because they do look pretty great on photographs if you've got the right gear. Um, other than that, this time of year, of course, things getting dark a lot later. Um, the planets, most of them are not particularly visible at the moment, and, and even if they are, it's very, very early hours of the morning, four, five o'clock or, or so. So some of the usual suspects that we look for in the night sky are not around, but what are things should we, we're looking out for in the night sky as we move through the next few weeks in towards the start of June. Yeah, we are starting to struggle with some of the deeper structures now. So really, it's a, it's a time of year to look out for the, the noctilucent clouds, but also brighter stars, um, maybe some constellation mapping of some of the brighter uh, constellations as well. Um, they're, they're, they're the kind of major objects to look at just with the naked eye. Anything else, things like the Milky Way and stuff, we won't get at this time of year, unfortunately. Not here in the north, though. Um, but if you were further down the country, you might start to see um, sections of the Milky Way creeping through uh, once it's, it gets a little bit darker um, but that will start to disappear as we head towards the equinox as well so really for this time of year for some really good quality stargazing we want to get to somewhere like Spain so if you're going on your holidays uh, great for you to do some stargazing on your holidays if you can get somewhere nice and dark um, from, from June onwards the Milky Way is in an absolutely stunning position to observe the centre of our Milky Way galaxy down towards where that ginormous uh, uh, supermassive black hole sits, um, Sagittarius area. We can we can start to see that. Um, but also this time of year is a very good time of year, um, just even even here in the northeast, to spot one of my favourite constellations. It's the constellation of Scorpius. And in Scorpius, it, you've got these beautiful stars which create the, uh, the claws of Scorpius. Um, and the, there's a star in there, a beautiful red star called Antares. And through a telescope, it's absolutely gorgeous. A beautiful, bright red object. Amazing thing to look at. So one to look out for there, Antares. I noticed last night when I was just glancing up at the night sky uh, before uh, before shutting the shop up for the evening. And uh, I noticed um, Lyra was, was quite... Um, prominent in in the night sky and uh, Vega of course is one of the the brightest stars in the sky but I was reading up on Vega as you do you must just remind myself about that and it is um it is a a star that actually if you put them side by side it's about twice the size of the sun isn't it it's a big old thing and actually because it's bigger it's its lifespan is about equal to that of the sun in terms of how they go even though it's a younger star in in the history of the universe but because it's bigger and burning brighter it's uh, it's about the same age technically 
Yeah, it is. It is a very comparable star with ours. Um, it will burn out potentially quicker than ours um, because it is bigger and brighter. Um, generally, these things when they st- when they're bigger, they have shorter lifespans. So you could you could map it like a curve um, in terms of that. Particularly the massive, massive ones. I mean, th- things like for example, Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is way bigger than our sun. Our sun's a million miles in diameter. Betelgeuse is eight hundred and ninety million miles in diameter. Um, wow. And and it's only eight and a half million years old. I'm going to say only eight and a half million years old. It's that's pretty old. But consider that that was born way after the dinosaurs became extinct here on Earth, and it's already uh, potentially dead. Um, we do, we don't know. It could the, the 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 kind of window in which we think it will die is a hundred thousand years. So it might have happened already. Might happen in a hundred thousand years time, but it is certainly very very close to the end. But it's because it's such a large star, and it has experienced some really interesting chaotic past. So we think as well. Um, so generally, the bigger the star, the shorter the lifespan. But also, the bigger the star, sometimes the brighter it can be as well. So. Well, it's it's that's quite a quite a window to work out whether it's still going or not considering we're in the year 2022 and it's a window of 100,000 years there's going to be a lot of post-it notes left around to to pass on that one um <laughs> but i was reading as well that, that vega um if and this this is in by comparison like next week but in i think the year what 13,000 or, or something like that it's going to become much more brighter in the sky I mean, it will be the brightest star in it was once br- the brightest star in the sky and is is going to be again in uh 11,000 years. That's interesting. I didn't know that. I, I, I don't I don't really know a massive amount about Vega other than its size and colour. Uh, <laughs> and also, it was, of course, a very big subject in the 90s because it was uh, the focus of the film uh, Contact in 1997. It was around Vega that we um, made first contact with alien life. Um, and actually, I've got something to talk about with that. Uh, mm. Have you met an alien? No, no, no. Although we did think that we'd seen aliens not long since. There was a, a re-entering really? rocket booster a few weeks ago and all of the guests were like, oh, what's that? And we were like, don't know, to be honest. Well, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine? The, 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 yeah, the first contact of alien life moving in through the atmosphere and they happen to <laughs> land next to Kielder Water. Imagine that. Imagine that would that. be convenient. But that actually does bring us on to something, doesn't it? Because you, on the subject of contact, you uh, you had something to tell us. I did, yeah. Um, the story is just about some events of which we're running um, on the 24th, 25th and 26th of June. We are trialling some new events. We're calling it the, the Light Sky Festival or the Light Nights Festival. Um, rather than the Dark Nights Festival. Um, so Light Nights Festival. And and what we're doing is a programme of events over that weekend which are not so, as such geared around stargazing because we can't do stargazing that well around the equinox. It's, it's very, very bright. So instead, on um, Friday, the 24th of June, we will be having a comedy night with Felt Nout, uh, who are a local comedy group. They're coming up to the observatory um, to do an hour's worth of comedy. And then after that, you'll get a tour of the observatory um, and uh, and have some chats with us as the astronomers. And if we can do any observations, then, of course, we'll, we'll do that as well. Um, on the Saturday, we'll be um, hosting uh, our first Kids uh, Light Year Academy, as we're calling it. So this is designed for kids to come and move through our graduate programme, How to Become an Astronomer. We'll be doing some hands-on tasks, um, including exploring light, uh, building rockets, um, some of the best bits from our Space Kids event all merged into one event and you'll leave with a couple of freebies things like a, a Kielder cup and um, a, uh, a little graduate certificate and uh, a mission patch and various other bits and pieces um, so that'll be a nice event for the kids on uh, the Saturday and in, in fact the Sunday as well so they'll be earlier on in the daytime from about 3.30 um, and then on the Saturday night we'll be running event uh, from 8 o'clock which is around the film Contact we'll be streaming the film uh, or, or, or watching the film um, in our main building on our 4K projector um, on our wooden seats, which we'll make quite comfy. We'll, we'll stick some cushions on there and stuff. And so we'll, so we'll sit and watch Contacts and enjoy a bit of Matthew McConaughey and Jodie Foster and the wonderful script writing of, uh, of, of, of course, Carl Sagan, the legendary astronomer and science communicator. 
um, who died quite some time ago now. Um, and he wrote this particular story with his wife. Um, the story is uh, based around the science, which was uh, current at the time, um, exploring radio astronomy, the, the, the SETI project. Um, and the SETI project in this film make first contact with uh, an alien civilization, and it's the story that spans out around that. Then after that, after we've watched the film, we'll be dissecting the science, uh, learning a little bit about radio astronomy, and hoping get to use our radio telescope on that night as well. And if we can observe the star Vega, then of course we'll observe the star Vega and such as well. So it'll be quite a nice, interesting event on uh, on the Saturday there as well. So that's it. I love it. It's a great idea of uh, turning the, watching the movie and then, and then exploring the science and, and seeing the things from the movie yourself with your own eyes through our telescopes. Um, something else that you can see through the telescope is actually much closer to home because coming up in the first week of June, which, of course, if you're listening to this later in June, this, this event will have already happened. But on the 2nd of June, um, across the whole of the UK, various beacons are going to be lit in celebration of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. One of these beacons is going to be lit at Deadwater Fell, which is um, the big hill opposite Keel to the other side of the valley. And instead of staring deep into space at galaxies millions of light years away, I'm going to turn one of our telescopes straight across the valley to Deadwater Fell. So we'll be able to get a good picture of Steve Cram through the telescope, lighting the beacon at Deadwater Fell. Now, this is something that's going to be live streamed as well, isn't it? If you can't make it there in person because because the tickets have sold out, you'll be able to watch this online. Tell us about that, Dan. That's right. Yeah, we'll be do- we'll be doing that. Um, we'll be we'll be lighting the beacon and streaming it live on on Facebook. Hopefully, all being well, provided there isn't a little cloud that comes and obscures the top of the hill because it is quite high up, and sometimes it does get a little bit of fog around it. So, fingers crossed, the fog stays away and we're able to. See the uh, the top of the hillside um and we'll be streaming it on on facebook as as all of that takes place absolutely and and yes tickets are now sold out there was a, a limited quantity available but you can't get up to the observatory without a ticket unfortunately um but you can come to any other part of the park and uh and deadwater fell is very very high you can see it from much of the park um so hopefully you'll be able to see it from wherever you are with a pair of binoculars maybe <laughs> So keep an eye out for that. Then that's going to be on the 2nd of June. Um, the event's going to be happening across the country, but that's the, the Kielder leg of it. And uh, all the info about the live stream will be on social media, of course, and uh, see how that all goes. But of course, you might be going to an event nearby where you are as well. There's going to be lots of them. Um, right now, let's turn our attention to the month of June as we move through this, this next month uh, looking ahead and do our regular feature Pie in the Sky, where Director of Astronomy at Kielder Observatory, Dan Pye, gives you something a little bit uh, a little bit different to look for, your challenge for the month of astronomy. Uh, Dan, what is the pie in the sky task for this month? You know what, I'm going to cheat because I want people to, to really look out for noctilucent clouds, so I'm going to leave my pie in the sky um, thing for this month as looking out for noctilucent clouds and I'd love to see people sharing their photographs with us as well. If you tweet us them at Kielder underscore obs um, or find us on Facebook and send us them on there, that would be great. We'd love to see all of your uh, noctilucent cloud images images over the next month as the the season starts to ramp up yeah and of course if you do get any other images that you'd like to share with us from the night sky either through a telescope or just above your house wherever you are we'd always love to see them as well and you can get in touch on any of our social media platforms just search for kielder observatory on twitter facebook or instagram you're listening to the kielder observatory podcast You're listening to the Kielder Observatory podcast. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ian Brannan. I'm joined by Director of Astronomy at Kielder Observatory, Dan Pye. And our special guest is our photographic artist researcher in residence, Helen McGee. 
Um, Helen is also a senior lecturer in photography at the University of Sunderland and is involved in an artistic installation called Another Dimension and she's going to tell us all about it. First of all, welcome along, Helen. Hello. I'll start by telling us about Another Dimension because there are a couple of dimensions to this, aren't there? Uh, Which is, first of all, there's an online exhibit that people can see wherever they might be in the world, which is on the kielderobservatory.org website. But for anybody who's arriving at Kielder Observatory, Observatory over the next few months or so. Uh, there is a, an artistic installation which you can see from the track as you make your long, windy, windy way up the track to the, to the observatory. Uh, you can see this. So tell us all about it, Helen. So, yes, that's right. There's um, a new banner exhibition of my photographs um, that I've been working on over the last um, few years. Uh, I've been working with the observatory since. 2017, which has uh, flown by, I must say. Um, So there's a series of 11 um, images uh, that are positioned at different points up the Sky Space Trail, um, beginning from the the, uh, Sky Space car park at the bottom and sort of on their way to um, the Sky Space um, part of the Art and Architecture Trail, which are then you can carry on walking up to the top where the observatory is. Um, and the images there, they, they show um, portraits um, of some of the staff actually at uh, Kielder Observatory um, and sort of other stargazers as well, um, encountering the night and the, the protected dark skies that there are at, at Kielder. Um, there's also uh, other sort of astro um, uh, phenomena in my work. So I've got um, the uh, Kielder Observatory's SDSS plate, um, which is back in the observatory now, but it was in my art studio for a while. Um, and uh, there's there's other things as well. There's, there's an interior shot of the uh, observatory uh, and you might even find something a landscape that looks a little bit like um, a sort of Martian uh, terrain, but it's in fact a photograph of the car park at Kielder lit by red red light. I've seen some of the photos and they look tremendous and I'm sure they're going to look even more stunning as they're placed among the trees on the track up to the observatory. Now, another dimension has been supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, hasn't it? How long is it going to be in position for? It's there, um, we've, we've said, until the end of September. Um, so the 30th of September, um, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that the banners will last <laughs> until it's then. It's just storms <laughs> pending. <laughs> yeah. They're going to blow away. <laughs> I know. There's that kind of worry. I sort of found myself researching, you know, strong rope and the best sort of reinforced material I could find. Um and uh, yeah, last last week I had the amazing team um, in the in Forestry England helping me tie knots, and they were, you know, experts. And I was sort of the one stood there going a bit to the left, up, down. What knot is that? That's an interesting looking knot. Um, so, uh, but yeah, no, they they just a stellar job to say the least. Well, let's uh, fingers crossed that those knots all hold up and uh, and everything stays in place because it's it's a stunning exhibition and that's the one that you go and see in person on the track up to the observatory. But there's also an online version of your exhibition too that people can find out more about Kielder Observatory and get some of the views both inside the observatory and, and, and around the area and, of course, in the night skies above from the comfort of wherever they may be online. That's right. So, so both parts of the project um, a, are a part of my PhD, which I'm doing um, with the University of Sunderland. Um, and it's a PhD in partnership with Kielder, where what I'm doing is I'm trying to explore and find new creative encounters with dark skies in Northern England. So that's where the relationship came from. And I've tried to, do, to explore that in different ways. So another dimension is kind of a big project for the final sort of practical element of what I'm doing. Um, and um, and that began um, sort of late last year, at the end of the year, where I um, work to produce a um, an augmented reality experience of the observatory. So you can, I've mapped it out um, with some software uh, and then I've added in my photographs into that work as well, into that space. So you can engage with the environment. Um, you can engage with the um, observatory building and the turrets um, and also the forest as a landscape itself, because 
um, I think that there's something really um, exciting and um, otherworldly about Kielder um, as a place anyway. Um, even on you know nights when the weather is not as we wish and we can't see the stars, there's still a feeling of, of um, something otherworldly and, and exciting uh, about, about the trip there. And that's what I found. Um, so that's what the work's really trying to show. So um, with the online element, it has my images, um, some of which are in the banner, banner exhibition at the moment, but they are, um, they are sort of digitally suspended in the landscape as it were. And there's film there as well. And there's sound that also um, is photographic because it's, um, actually uh, images that have been converted into sound and um, so they sound a bit kind of scientific sci-fi but a bit odd a bit weird um and that, that sort of helps you navigate the environment um which is is really interesting so so yeah so it's all about you know and and the reason that i called the whole project another dimension is because for me it's, it has quite a broad meaning and can be interpreted in different ways so another dimension is you know the arts thinking you know about how the arts can create another dimension of the observatory experience um, but also thinking about how, um, you know, it's like another dimension to uh, an experience is going to a protected dark sky um, park, such as the observ where the observatory is located in Kielder Forest. So, um, so yeah, that's what it's all about, if that makes sense. <laughs> and why astronomy? Why, why the night sky? Why Kielder Observatory when it, when it came to doing this particular project? What was it about space and, and the observatory that, that attracted you? Well, I mean, as an artist, I've spent many hours staring into space, as you can imagine, um, both metaphorical and uh, <laughs> in a physical way. Um, but um, basically, uh, a few different reasons, really. Um, I mean, I was brought up in a household full of uh, sort of with sci-fi on the television all the time. Um, so my brother was into Doctor Who when it wasn't cool, you know, when I was young, uh, sort of in the 90s. Um, and uh you know star wars that kind of thing so it's it's come and that's why i'm quite inspired by scientific um sort of sci-fi um imagery and I, i'm inspired with that in my work um but also you know i'm not an astronomer um i i don't have that knowledge but there is that link with photography and science it's always there um a lot of the um the uh, you know the original um uh, people who were were using uh, cameras the the inventors of of cameras were actually astronomers as well and they were almost trying to create something to um actually be able to see uh, and to sort of um objectively look at and uh understand um the world and and you know space and you know the moon was quite quite famous in sort of john william draper's original um images um think things like that so so there's that link but also you know i i actually have used um a lot of analog processes in my work throughout the years um i used to run a dark room and we do a lot of it at sunderland so spending time in darkness is actually really linked to uh, my practice as an artist um, and therefore it still you know it has that connection and that parallel um, um, under, I don't know relationship between astronomy and photography really that I, I'm yeah that, that inspires me so, so it's a different perspective that I have on astronomy um, and um, but yeah I hope that it, it the work that I'm doing is is it's there to sort of engage people in a different way um you know perhaps to to draw um the dark skies uh into the summer at the moment or into the experience of being at home if you're looking online so it's accessible to a different audience and and encouraging um the audience to perhaps return to the observatory um or you know or visit the observatory um during the the sort of winter months when um the the best there's the best chance of seeing seeing the stars yeah, dark uh, darkness and red lights are the two things that link the uh, the observatory and, and photography. <laughs> I think that's uh, two two things they have in common there. Um, and obviously, this is a, a, a project that's it's got a couple of different arms. We've got that um, virtual exhibition, which you can see on the Kielder Observatory website. We've got this um, banner exhibition now of, of some of the photographs you've taken that uh, people can see going up the track. Are there any other elements in in the pipeline and are you planning to take this any further well 
I've been sort of uh, in instructed that by my uh, PhD supervisor that I need to sort of actually calm down and do some writing. Um, so <laughs> it's been a bit of a bonkers year because, um, I mean, part of what the, the, the method um, of, of what the PhD is, is, is actually making the work in partnership with the observatory. So that's involved a film, some um, images and also um, the, the virtual element um, and the sound that I've made. And I was testing that in different contexts to sort of um, engage audiences in different ways. So it was, first of all, was in a London exhibition right back in 2018. Um, then was in a, a in a group show in Sunderland um, called Observe Exper Experiment Archive, which was um, curated by the North East Photography Network to look at um, the relationship between photography and science more broadly. Um, so that was interesting to look at the work in the context of other other people's um, practice, you know, might be to do with botany or, um, you know, health, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and, then, and then now this has been the sort of final element where I really wanted to bring the work back into the, the context of Kielder itself. Um, so, so yeah, so, so it's the online exhibition. And then in, in February, we, we had a, I had a week up in the observatory where um, I ran a, an event called the, dark, the Art of Dark Skies, which was great because um, it was a, it, it was, it enabled a conversation uh, with the audience, which was um, both fine art and creative, um, you know, thinking about astronomy, but also the kind of technical ways of, um, creating images and and you know how those two things come together and can critique each other in a, in an interesting way. So, um, so there was that, and that, that's I had a sort of sound trail with with some of my um, sounds that I made from photos. Um, but yeah, no, the the banner exhibition is kind of the last the last thing. But hopefully, there will be. Um, I made a film at the observatory called Observatory. Um, and uh, that is, um, I'm planning, I'm hoping um, that that will be um, screened uh, in, in Kielder um, in the summer at some point as well to sort of uh, create another event that visitors can can explore. I, I really love the uh, the banner exhibition. I think it's really great um, because for, for, for me, I think um, from from my perspective of, of how we do things on a daily basis, having something more that just creates that theatre and drama for the guests is just uh, anything that can add to that is, is an incredible asset. And I think it really does add to that. And like you say, being able to demonstrate what things are like in the wintertime um, is something that we will always have a difficulty with during the summertime. So any opportunity that we can get to, to to give guests that experience or that or create that environment for them is, is incredibly important to us. So I absolutely love that exhibition and, and the augmented reality thing on the website is absolutely brilliant as well. And we should probably actually share that a little bit more on our social media because it is quite a fun little thing to uh, to, to, to get uh, to get interactive with. And, and one thing I really loved as well, which you did when you came up um uh, a few a couple of months ago was the 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 sonifying the the the, the pictures and and the, the, what i'd love to explore more of is how we can sonify some of the images that we get from our radio telescope because that's using a different type of light and we can create an image from that um and it does have uh, a sound which we can extract from it as well but it will be interesting to see what sonifying just the actual file does um for you as well so well Absolutely. I mean, it's it's really. I'm really pleased that you you're in, enjoying the the work uh, on the on the trail and and thinking about the online element as well because, um, because because part of what I'm what I'm trying to do is use art to enrich the visitor experience um, at the observatory and to, you know, every it's such an exciting and wonderful and inspiring place to visit that I've you know I'm so thrilled and lucky that I've been in, involved for so long. Um, but I just wanted to provide an, an alternative experience um, through my work that isn't always um, it isn't dependent on the right time of the day or the, the you know the weather to be you know as we want it to be. It just but it's still giving that feeling of um, well I hope anyway of, of inspiration or or sort of um, you know astronomy and magic and all of that kind of thing that that I think are, are so important with inspiring people. Um, you know, and, and I really want my artwork to be to be functional um, to to different audiences. Um, you know, not just art audiences, but actually audiences much broader than that. Who 
you know, might not be um, so, I mean, I don't always feel comfortable going into a museum or a gallery. Sometimes I get a bit paranoid and think, oh God, am I going to get this? Am I going to understand it? Um, and, but I, what I like, what I've tried to, to create is a sense of almost um, like accidental encounter with artwork where, um, you know, the banners, you might not know about them if you're walk on a walk and you might suddenly see them and think, oh, what's that? And it's something curious in the landscape that might make that person, you know, feel an intervention or feel a little bit differently just for a, a moment out of their day, and you know, perhaps they'll 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 just experience the the environment in a in a, in a different way. Um, so that, you know, that's what I've tried to do. And um, in terms of the uh, the sonified um, work that I did, then yeah, absolutely, I'm very keen to to help you with that <laughs> if you want me to turn it into something um, sound. Because the thing is, I remember someone saying to me when I have my my sound trail, they were like, you know, it's really weird because it's like there is no sound in space. Um, so you've created this like perceived reality of what space sounds like, but it's all based on our kind of cultural understanding of what we think it sounds like which again is based on you know again with me because I am not a scientist it's based on films that I've watched and you know television programs and stories so um but yeah I mean I think it, it's really curious because everything in, in science so much is is um about looking and being able to see um, as with art and photography quite often as well but you know the question that I've asked myself is how can people encounter you know like, like with the sound trail how can people encounter dark skies um, without light because well, the last thing you want to do is illuminate something in a dark place that defeats the object of being in a dark sky park um, so you know how can you experience photography in that environment um, and and, and they, you know it enable you to feel something different so so what i was trying to do with that sound was to almost create almost the chaos of explosions and you know collisions going on in in in, in the you know in beyond our atmosphere in space so you could almost look up and imagine that within your mind um and it didn't matter really um that you couldn't see it necessarily um i just think it's just a new accessible way of doing it really and it's it's all based, you know, because part, apart from anything, we know so little about the universe. Um, you know, it's what five percent we understand, or, or whatever. So, you know, in a way, it's like you know, the other ninety-five percent is up for grabs. So, um, I've tried to kind of create that through my that that I don't know that opportunity for people to to try it out and see what they can find in that other ninety-five percent from an imaginative point of view well i don't know if you've seen this um thing from a, a few weeks ago now at the time of the recording this the uh, recording by the chandra x-ray observatory which was a recording of pressure waves sent out by a black hole and this is the first time we've ever heard a black hole and what we were saying there there's there's no sound in space but nasa have explained that actually with galaxy clusters um, there's so much gas around that actually there probably would be sound waves uh, that deep in space and certainly enough to, to make it travel. So what they've done is they've managed to find out um, the, 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 the frequencies of these sound waves and, and made them a reality. So this is what a black hole sounds like. not at all creepy is it <laughs> absolutely it's, it sounds really like Stan said like creepy and uh, mysterious um, but it's, it's quite interesting just thinking yeah. about the sounds that I've made because some of them had a I don't know a deep slightly creepy vibe to them as well um, so it's just interesting how data is turned in you know how sound data has this sort of uh, ethereal and, and um, you know deep feeling uh to it uh when you start exploring it but wow i didn't um i didn't i hadn't heard that and it's amazing um very good uh, for my research i'll uh, make a note of that <laughs> thank you <laughs> i think what they've done is because i think the, the the actual sounds would be beyond the the human ear spectrum so they've they've lifted them up quite a a, a lot a lot uh in in the spectrum of, of of what it would be so that we can actually understand them but if our ears could hear them that's what we would hear i think is basically it so um it's it's, it's an interesting thing and, and certainly shows that there is sound in space and debunks that myth that that in space 
space no one can hear you scream um, they probably could if you were surrounded by galaxy dust <laughs> in which case you'd be all right um so uh, this this exhibition now is, is is now there people can can actually see it if you're going up the track anytime over the, the coming months over the course of the summer shall we say till the end of september uh, provided we have no major storms that, uh, <laughs> that cause you some problems but assuming that's not the case keep your eyes out as you're going up the track um up to keelder observatory and look out for another dimension, which is the uh, the art installation uh, from Helen McGee, who's our guest uh, on this episode of the Kielder Observatory podcast. Do you have any other works out there anywhere else that people might be able to, to see? Or is it all purely space? Um, it, well, at the moment, it's mainly space, really. I'm, I'm quite intrigued by the, the sort of sense of the unseen in photography, because... Uh, photography is very much about looking and being able to reveal something so um, I've got a website as well which is helenmcgee.com um, and uh, spell m-c-g-h-i-e it's a bit of an odd odd spelling um, and so there's some of my other work on there as well um, that you can explore and that's the Kilda Observatory photographic artist in residence, uh, Helen McGee. Thanks for joining us. And Helen would like your help as well. If you are going up the track to Kilda Observatory and you see the art installation Another Dimension, she'd love to hear your thoughts about it. So uh, you can get in touch with her, helen.mcgee at research dot sunderland dot ac dot uk if you'd like to share your experience of the banner or online exhibitions it's all really useful for her phd thesis so you're helping out with the grand project here helen dot mcgee at research dot sunderland dot ac dot uk uh, to give your feedback to the Another Dimension artistic installation. And Another Dimension has been supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, so I do hope you enjoy it when you go along to see it. And our thanks once again to Helen for joining us. Thank you, Helen. Good to speak to you. Thank you so much. It's been great ta- talking to you, Bo. And uh, that draws us to a close for this episode of the Kielder Observatory podcast. Uh, now, quick updates on availability and things like that and an overview of the sessions. Things very busy, but of course, as usual, keep your eyes out on social media. But um, anything coming up over the next month or so that people should be particularly aware of, Dan? We've got a Light Nights Festival. That's the next thing. Um, hopefully we should be... Uh, in fact, by the time this podcast goes out, we might be uh, already advertising those on our uh, on our website. Um, um, other than that, it um, goes back to business as usual after that, um, through the summertime. Summertime is always quite busy for us as people are on a holiday, of course. Um, but we still have availability for some parts of it. And um, there's always cancellations that come through here and there as well from uh, COVID cases and such as well. Restrictions still in place at the observatory. Um, we do that. There's uh, been a few questions as to why we're still using masks. The reason being is because we are a very small team, and if we lose a member of the team due to a COVID infection um, from an event, then uh, sometimes it can it can put extra pressure on running the the stuff that we do on a daily basis. Um, so that's so that's why we're still taking it. extra precautions for for our safety and also of course for your safety. Um, you're in a room for a long period of time sometimes, uh, very close to other individuals, and some people still don't feel comfortable with that. So just for just for extra safety, we're still asking people to keep their masks on when they come to the observatory. And if you don't come with one, don't worry about that. That's fine. We have them at the observatory anyway. Um, other than that, I think um, that's 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 it from me, really. Uh, no, nothing else to update. It's all, it's all gravy. Keep an eye out for the noctilucent clouds then over the coming weeks. That's your challenge. Look north and uh, see what you see on a nice, clear night. You might see those noctilucent clouds. We'll be back at some point in June for the next episode of the Kielder Observatory podcast as the nights get lighter, but of course there will be that point where they start getting darker again, just about. Uh, that's for June, though, and we'll join you on the next episode of the Kielder Observatory podcast. <laughs>